words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. The doors were shut tight, shut tight on Easter evening, because Easter was not joyous, but ominous. Because Easter was not a celebration, but weird threat. The doors were shut for safety, shut in fear, shut in order to hide. The people of Jesus shut behind closed doors, hoping no one would notice or disturb or harm. But this story is not about shut doors. That's only stage setting. The very next phrase gets to the action. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, it took three quick verbs. He came, he stood, he said. We do not know how he got there, how he penetrated behind shut doors. The doors were intended to keep people out, but Jesus came and disrupted their safe hiding. As soon as he arrives, Jesus takes over the meeting. He dominates the room. Nobody else gets a chance to talk, not to speak a word. Jesus speaks a magisterial speech. Jesus has come here because these are his people. He has just come to his new life. What he does first with his new life is to seek out his people who are in hiding because he has four things to say to them that they need to hear. They are four things only Jesus can say. They are things that once said to us can never be unsaid. We cannot pretend they were not said or that we did not hear. They are four assertions that have decisively changed the life of the church. And here are four words for you. First, Jesus comes to the cowering church and says, Peace be with you. They check him out, touch his hands and side. He's the real guy. And he says again, Peace be with you. That is the first word of the powerful Christ to the fearful church. The phrase is a Jewish greeting. If Jesus had been a southerner, he might have said, hey, but he didn't. He said, peace. The word on the lips of Jesus is a powerful word, claiming the space, setting the agenda, redefining reality. The Jesus who says the word brings the reality of what he says. He is the person you trust the most. When that person enters the room, that person's very presence reshapes the room and makes it different. Some theological work is required to avoid the mistake of assuming that our favored definition of the word, the absence of conflict, the presence of quiet and rest, everyone agreeing and getting along, is what Jesus has in mind when he offers his disciples peace. This is the peace that comes when our worst fears are not realized. The relief that against all odds, death has not won. Jesus' second peace be with you, maybe a not so fast kind of peace, a kind of peace that lasts beyond the initial rush, that abides even when one remembers the cost and the challenges that still lie ahead. Christ's victory will be theirs as well, but in order to get there, 
They will need the kind of peace that abides even when in the midst of their own blood, thorns, and cross, victory seems a dim and distant possibility. The peace Jesus offers has nothing to do with tranquility, harmony, affability. Instead, in this passage, Jesus invites his disciples into the same activity of peacemaking that characterized his own life and ministry. The peace Jesus' ministry announces is nothing like the peace either the religious leaders or the political authorities desired. Jesus' peace is the sort that brings back into the fold the outcast and the marginalized and turns upside down the societal conventions of first and last, blessed and cursed, rich and poor. Jesus' peace invites the lion to see the lamb as neighbor and friend, the Jew to speak with the Samaritan, and the prostitute to dine with the Pharisee. Such actions show to those with eyes to see a new way of being in the world a vision inspired by the inbreaking of the kingdom of God present in Jesus' very existence. Second, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The coming of Jesus is not just a nice presence. It is a mission. I do not know where you are sent, but I give you this word from Jesus. You are sent. And if you want the peace of Jesus, then you must accept the sending of Jesus. Jesus is sending all of his disciples, all those baptized in his name, all who share his life, all to the neighbor whom God loves, all to the neighbor in need. We are a means to God's longer end. Before the sun sets, each of us must rethink this sending and how we will go and where. If we do not go, we can forget about his offer of peace. Third, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. The statement is a promise from the risen Jesus to the fearful church. Taken most simply, Holy Spirit refers to the energizing power from God that comes like the wind to blow us beyond ourselves, to take actions, to dare dreams, to run risks that in our accustomed powerlessness are well beyond us. The assurance of Jesus is that the wind of God will blow us to freedom and courage in spite of our tired fearfulness. It's a good thing Jesus gave that promise right after he said, I send you, Because our answer to the sending might be, I cannot go, or I will not go. I do not have any passion, any energy, even any will. Jesus knows that about us. On our own terms, given our own resources, we are not going anywhere that matters. The church has never gone anywhere important under its own steam. We are subject to the power of God that will move us beyond ourselves to go where Jesus sends us, to do what God intends for our lives. We are candidates for the power to do miracles, to go beyond ourselves and our intents, beyond our habits in God's work of healing in the world. 
the wind is blowing. It is blowing in families and in communities and in churches. The wind of God is promised to us by the risen one who will never accept our fearful lethargy. It is this one who says to us, expect to be visited and summoned and authorized and surprised beyond our usual selves. Fourth, Jesus says, if you forgive sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive, they are retained. Sent in power with the business of forgiveness. The world cannot commit forgiveness for itself, cannot forgive itself. Forgiveness must come from the large heart of God enacted in the world. To forgive is to break the vicious cycles of death by a fresh act of utter generosity. The news is not just that God forgives, but that God has created a people to have as its main business in the world the forgiveness of sins, the cancellation of debts, the breaking of the power of fear and hate and death in order to start again. Imagine being behind closed doors and then to have this lordly one come among us. And this is what he says. Peace, a new shape of life. I send you. You cannot just sit around. You will get power to go beyond yourself, to forgive, to break the cycles of death, and give life a new chance. Jesus is a gate crasher. You may have the doors locked for safety and in fear. Then these four words are for you. Because the doors of safety and fear cannot withstand God's power for new life. The gates of hell cannot resist, nor the gates of fear. No wonder that when Jesus said these four things, the church was born, a new people in the world. And when you hear them, you will not be the same because Jesus has taken over the shape of your life. Amen.